At the end of the meeting, we'll post a brief poll. We want these webinars to meet your needs and your input is critical. While our presenter is speaking, we will have the lines muted to reduce unnecessary noise. We will unmute at the end of the presentations for questions and comments. Please feel free to enter questions into the chat box throughout the presentation. Now let me turn it over to our physician consultant, Dr. Lisa Letourneau. Great, well, thanks, Kate, and thanks everyone for joining us today. We know everyone's incredibly busy and these are crazy times, so we particularly uh, appreciate your efforts to um, take the time to keep thinking about some of these non-COVID issues about how we make sure we deliver high value care and decrease um, uh, waste and uh, capitalize on opportunities to improve both quality and costs for our patients. Um, so thank you um, again for joining us and a particular thank you to Dr. Andrew Whitman, who's joining us as our presenter today. Uh, Dr. Whitman is the lead clinical pharmacist in oncology and palliative care at the University of Virginia Health System in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, he's completed a combined doctor of pharmacy degree and certificate of aging studies at Virginia Commonwealth University School of Pharmacy and completed his postgraduate training at the University of Virginia Health System in oncology pharmacy, uh, followed by a year of palliative care at the University of Maryland, Baltimore, Washington Medical Center. Uh, so some great experience and background bringing to this topic. His current research interests include deprescribing of non-essential therapies in older adults and innovative approaches to supportive care, uh, specifically related to the use of cannabis and psychedelics in cancer care. Um, we were very pleased to see a recent paper uh, uh, with uh, Dr. Whitman as a lead author uh, titled Pharmacist-Led Medication Assessment and Deprescribing Interventions for Older Adults with Cancer and Polypharmacy, a pilot study. And he's gonna be speaking to that work and some of his ongoing um, efforts as well. So with that, I will turn it to you, Andrew. All right, thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here speaking with you about this topic. And thank you to uh, Kate, Lisa, and Kelly and choosing wisely to give me this opportunity to speak about this. Um, I'll just say a few things before I get going. Um, I, I'm gonna talk a, a bit about my pilot study, um, but I wanted to give a little bit of a different spin to this because you know, I could go over the data in my pilot study, but I really wanted to get into the meat of like how I came to create such a study. Like, you know, What's the background of polypharmacy assessment and deprescribing? So I'm gonna talk about some very general things that could be applied to your practice and then introduce my pilot study in a very kind of a practical way. Also, as I took that data and I said, this is a pop population I wanna apply this in. Um, and also, you know, I've, I've been told that I'm uh, the pharmacist that hates medications and you won't find someone that hates medications more than I, I do, which is a little odd for a pharmacist, but I'm really about, you know, the cho choosing wisely, you know, philosophy of you know, preventing medication waste and uh, you know, using things uh, in a really conscious way in our healthcare system. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk about sometimes less is more, recognizing polypharmacy and incorporating deep prescribing into your practice. Um, so I really don't have anything to disclose with one caveat that I have three children, one of which is eight weeks old. So they've all got together and decided they don't wanna sleep. So I have what my wife calls baby brain. So if I pause and I forget something, that's why. Um, so to go over some learning objectives. So I'm gonna talk about trends in medication use and risks associated with polypharmacy, uh, analyze methods of polypharmacy assessment and deprescribing. And then from that, I'm gonna talk about how I implemented a pharmacist led pilot study focused on deprescribing in older, uh, older adults with cancer. And finally look at some evidence-based deprescribing resources for patients, caregivers, and clinicians. So, when I started to think about this topic, I got some inf inspiration in several different ways. So I found this Choosing Wisely Things We Don't Do For No Reason series of you know, really practical things of you know, healthcare waste, like why are we doing this, questioning these practices. And it really inspired me and said, this is, this is on board for the type of thing that I wanna do. I wanna prevent waste. I wanna kind of minimize unnecessary, unnecessary things for my patients. And it just like, kind of sparked something in me. Um, and also I had the opportunity to work in a specialized clinic focused on the care of older adults with cancer, where we perform geriatric assessments. And I'll speak to Liz a little bit more when I talk about my pilot study. Uh, next in, in 2018, a personal impact of a family member. And, you know, you get that personal impact and that really resonates with you. And uh, you can see it firsthand how it 
plays a toll on not just the patient, but caregivers as well. Um, and then the present day, you know, I have a, a big interest in minimalism and mindfulness and uh, making sure that what we're doing is, is good for the patient, good for the environment. So I think a lot of these things are right in line with the Choosing Wisely uh, campaign. Um, so I want to start out with the audience participation question. So it might seem a little um, odd, the question that I'm about to ask, um, but I think it's worth thinking about and it's a somewhat sparking discussion. Uh, so that we're going to put a poll up, but the question is, is polypharmacy a disease? So let me know what you think. Yes, it is a disease. No, and or I don't know. I've never thought about it, but um, we got one no. Okay, I'll give you give everyone a minute to, to answer. Okay, so it looks like we have some no's and I don't know. So that's very consistent with the, the answers I've gotten in the past. So I think that um, when we think about polypharmacy in the true sense of it being disease, it's hard to say. So it's more of a philosophical question. There was a really excellent uh, article that I referenced at the bottom in the American uh, Medical Association Journal of Ethics, uh, where it talks about uh, the characterization of a disease, what a disease means, and then they talk about it in the context of polypharmacy. And it really argues that it that it is. So, you know, you have polypharmacy that creates some sort of environment for, for a patient that's that's negative. So we talk about diseases having risk factors. So polypharmacy having risk factors such as lots of comorbid diseases, lots of, lots of providers using lots of pharmacy. So we have exacerbating factors such as like transitions of care. These are times in a patient's care that something like polypharmacy can, can become worse. We have ways of assessing it. We have, we have uh, methods of assessing it just kind of like other disease states. And then we have uh, we have methods of resolution. So we're going to talk about deprescribing. So potentially an antidote or a cure or a way of approaching polypharmacy as a disease. All right. So we'll go to the next one. So I want to introduce you to Shirley. So Shirley is my actual grandmother. So she's since passed away. Um, I will have a caveat that the story was shared with her permission. Um, and it's been modified a little bit for just patient privacy. But uh, Shirley is an 87-year-old female with an extensive past medical history, including diabetes, stroke, atrial fibrillation, high cholesterol, depression, GERD, you name it, she had it, a remote history of lymphoma in her, in her 30s. Um, but uh, Shirley lived in an assisted living facility um, in Manhattan Beach, California. Um, she started to become disconnected with you know, her, 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 her colleagues. She started to stay in her room a lot. She didn't really have an appetite. She didn't want to socialize at all, you know, and going through her medications, um, you can see that uh, there's there's quite a few. So she wanted to just really, really stay in her room. She was very, very tired, very sleepy. You know, uh, she missed a lot of doctor's appointments, a lot of other visits to family members. So as you can see, it's a pretty extensive list of medications. Um, so this is not unlike lists that you've probably seen in your own practice. So an older adult with many comorbidities. Um, so this is a, probably a pretty extreme example. So what I call uh, grandson led deprescribing. So I had the luxury of being a pharmacist and working through her medications. Um, and again, this is an extreme example of I worked with many of her different care providers, her neurologist, her geriatrician, her primary care doctor, her cardiologist, her endocrinologist, her oncologist. So we had all these providers that were in the mix. We work with them to come up with a care plan. So after about six months of tweaking things, tapering off medications, we came up with five, five medications for her. So after that, her the outcomes from this were that she had a better appetite. She was more likely to socialize. She had more energy. Her quality of life was better. She remembered who my mom was for the first time in years because she was just had more clarity. So it was very, very impressive, very impactful. Um, so from this, how, how do we, how do we get to this current state of, of medication overuse? So how does it get so bad so quickly? So you can think of this as almost like a, a, a compilation of risk factors and kind of outcomes as well for polypharmacy. So there's the notion of a pill for every ill. So this is a um, this is an expectation from, from patients. And this type of thing is very, very complicated and it requires somewhat of a culture shift of you know, how we view medications, how we use medications, especially in American culture. 
uh, multiple comorbidities. And then this one's, uh, this one's also complicated, multiple providers, so guideline driven treatment. So we have a number of different providers that are doing an amazing job of doing guideline driven therapy for their patients. But a lot of time what happens is providers don't talk to each other and there's drug interactions that occur. There's a list of medications that become uh, complicated and this, this is you know, really promoting a lot of polypharmacy and inappropriate medication use. Um, lack of primary care provider or generalist, and this is what I call the medication hub. This is the person that potentially could be the, the one to bring all this together to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, transitions of care, it's a problem within the healthcare system. We, we create problems when we go from one phase to the next. A lot of it's information sharing or the, the lack of the ability to share information easily. Um, and a really big one for, for me is what I call prescribing inertia or repeat prescribing. And this occurs in, in many different care settings, but I see it a lot. I work primarily in, in the hospital inpatient solid tumor service of patients coming through the hospital, through the ED, they're admitted, and we have resident run services. And a lot of the reason why they may have been admitted or readmitted to the hospital is because of medication adverse effects. And instead of kind of teasing out those effects, we have just a, a habit of just continuing all those medications because of uh, you know, not wanting to rock the boat or it's complicated or you don't want to touch the medications prescribed by another physician. So it's very complicated. Um, prescribing cascades, which I'll show you an example of on, on the next slide. Um, and just some statistics. So greater than 50% of patients obtain prescriptions from more than one provider. So that's probably not uh, a shock. And then 31% of patients use more than one pharmacy to fill medications. So this is a problem when uh, medications aren't shared, uh, databases aren't shared in between different pharmacies. So this is an example of a prescribing cascade. So medication number one prescribed, uh, adverse effect occurs. So instead of questioning that adverse effect, we think of it as a new condition. So another medication is prescribed and then so forth. So this is just a vicious cycle that can occur. And I've often seen it also in loops that can occur. And then the initial symptom that happened um, ends up again because of another medication that was added. So some definitions of polypharmacy. So when I reviewed the literature years ago, so there's over 20 definitions of polypharmacy that have been described. And one of the biggest problems with this is the, the lack in standardization. So we have a lack of ability to research this topic because well, it's hard to do comparisons from one study to the next. But the most common definitions that I've seen, probably the most common is greater than five medications taken on a consistent basis and then nine medications uh, highly associated with certain outcomes such as hospital readmissions. And then greater than 10 medications has been called hyper polypharmacy or excessive polypharmacy. Um, so that's more of a quantitative way. We can also define it qualitatively. So potentially inappropriate medications, which we'll talk about next. And then simply just a medication without any indication. So some sort of phase of chair, uh, care has changed for the patient. So uh, that medication is no longer needed, but no one questions that. So these are some of the polypharmacy assessment tools. I've teased out a few of them um, that have been used um, in older uh, adults with cancer, but these are applicable to most geriatric settings or older adult settings. Um, and it's varying amount of supporting evidence in different disease states. Uh, most commonly used Beers criteria. This is created by Mark Beers in 1991. So this is a list of medications or you know, potentially avoid this medication consider you know, avoiding it. So it's been, there's been several versions of it. I think most, most recently in 2018 or 19. Um, stop start criteria, which is similar, but it's a systems-based approach. And then the medication appropriate index is a list of um, in, implicit questions that go through appropriateness. It's about 10 questions and you get a scoring uh, score based off the, the points that you accumulate for the, for the um, for the uh, for the index, and then the CEAS criteria, which is a combination of a polypharmacy assessment tool and an active deprescribing tool, which is very interesting. For for my population, for older adults with cancer, it hasn't been applied in that population yet. So the first three is primarily what I used in um, in my in my pilot study, as you'll see. On the right here, you'll see that there's a extensive list of implicit and explicit tools. So this comes out of a book chapter that I wrote for pharmacology of aging and cancer. And these are all the potential tools that have, are available in the older adult population. Again, varying uh, data supporting use in the older adult population. 
but they're anywhere from these Im implicit tools such as the medication appropriate index to very similar tools like beers criteria um, and then some of them are specific to the palliative care population some are specific to just assessing anticholinergic burden so a specific class of medications um, so these are all ways of, of looking at more qualitatively so outcomes associated with polypharmacy. So we have a way of defining it. We have a way of counting the number of medications, determining if they're appropriate. So if a patient is on one of these medications, what are, what are some potential outcomes? And I would say this is probably a short list. Um, so one of the big ones that I see is not in here, it's our pill burden. So this is a little bit counterintuitive, but the larger the number of uh, medications a person on, the more complicated it is, the more more likely they are to miss doses or not take medications be just because of the amount that, that are available. So, you know, in my study, we can see that deprescribing increases the rate of adherence to medications because patients have less to take, less to remember to take, so they're more likely to take the medications that are more important. Um, incomplete medication lists. So again, this is just a logistical problem of information gathering. Uh, reduced understanding of medication regimen. There's one study that showed that uh, when patients were discharged from the hospital with 100% of those patients having a medication change, only 7% of those patients were able to determine that they had a change and what the change was. Um, outcomes from polypharmacy, big ones are geriatric syndromes. So increasing the risk of falls, both in the community setting and in the hospital, and then frailty. 80% um, of patients taking seven or more medications have an adverse drug reaction. So there's, there's a high likelihood that these medications are causing some sort of harm. And this is a big one in our healthcare system. This is when we get into financial toxicity cost. So 20% of all hospital admissions and readmissions are associated with an adverse drug reaction. Um, so uh, increased healthcare utilization and costs go, go right along with that. And there's been several studies that show that polypharmacy in simply just looking at the quantity of medications, there's an increased risk of death for patients. So uh, it wouldn't be a, a pharmacy presentation with talk, without talking about drug interactions. So as you can see, the percentages are very tightly associated with medication quantity. So five to nine medications versus 20 plus medications, regardless of what the medications are, the, the risk of drug-drug interactions goes up with the quantity of medications. Um, so again, not necessarily because of the specific interactions, but simply because of the quantity of the medications. Um, so the next two slides, I would say, that are the most important, I would think, to pull from it. So if you're going to remember anything that I, I say, I think these two slides are a good summary of, of uh, a way to apply it to several different practice areas. So timing of assessment and intervention, this is something that is uh, has been studied a little bit, but but there's a good gap in the literature on timing of the assessment. So when's the best time to do this? Um, there's there's so many opportunities, uh, but what's the ideal time? So we could say ideally at every visit, uh, modification of a therapy, transitions of care, and this is when you're getting in, into a lot of a lot of healthcare uh, power. So you need a lot of people to work on this. Um, but if you start to think about deprescribing polypharmacy assessment in, in terms of a good prescribing continuum. So every time a medication is added, you should question whether we can stop an existing medication. So I think this is a, a good paradigm shift of initial prescribing, monitoring, modification. So that's typically been what we've, we've thought as the prescribing continuum. But if we include deprescribing in there, that's setting up from the very beginning that this is not a forever medication. You know, there's going to be something in terms of your phases of care, your goals of care that are going to change. And not that that's going to happen for every medication, but there's a likelihood that this medication potentially could be stopped in the future. It's going to be, it's going to change the way patients think about medications. Um, and directly related to that, so empowering patients and family members to start conversations about appropriate medication use. So kind of marketing it to your patients that this service is available or potentially it's available and helping them understand that um, you know, medications aren't forever medications most of the time. So bringing up these discussions is really important. So getting in front of deprescribing barriers as we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, I talk about medication goals. So uh, what is your medication goal? Just like what's your goal of care is for, for uh, just, just, in, in just in life. Um, but these need to align with current values. So do we wanna take medications just for symptom management and you know, longevity? So a combination of, of those two. So those are really important things to tease out. And then when you get that information for patients, 
sometimes it makes it much, much easier to have those conversations about peeling medications off when they become unnecessary. So kind of along the same lines as um, uh, train the phases of care or timing of medications. These are really simple questions that you can ask related to medications. So what's the medic patient's medication story or medication's history? So I find this a really an interesting concept of you're basically digging back and saying, how did this medication reach this patient in the first place? Was it because of a prescribing cascade or was it entirely appropriate in that phase of care when years ago, but now it's, and now it's inappropriate? So you're sort of like a detective in determining uh, where did this medication come from? Um, so why is the patient on a potentially inappropriate medication? Did they fail a sale for safer alternative or is there no alternative that exists? So is your attempt to change it to something futile because this is really the only therapy? And then simply, are there any medications we can stop today? So even if it doesn't happen, that brings up the conversation that reevaluating re medications is really important. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about deprescribing, and I really like it in the, this framework of, uh, we call it the Holmes framework, it comes from Holly Holmes. It's the pillars of appropriate medication use, and there's been several versions of this over the years, but these four, I think if you apply these to medication use, polypharmacy, and deprescribing interventions, um, and this is much more applicable to patients with life-limiting illness than the general geriatric, general geriatric population. Um, but I think concepts such as time to benefit. So that patient takes a dose of that drug right now, when are they gonna get the intended benefit of the drug? So is it a statin medication where they need to take it for years and years and years before they get a cardiovascular benefit versus an opioid where they're gonna get a relief in 15 minutes because the intended benefit is the analgesic effect. So we tie that really closely into patients' life expectancy. So patients have a limited life expectancy, you know, six months or less, there's data to say that certain medications, you're not gonna get that time to benefit of the therapy. Patient goals, so this is very simple. So what's the intended goal of the patient? Again, I, I mentioned it before, is it longevity? Is it management of chronic disease? Is it preventing worsening of those chronic diseases? Is it simply just being, being comfortable? Um, again, and the purpose of the ther therapy is directly related to those, those patient goals. So is it curative or for, for, for patients with cancer or is it palliative intent? Um, so with this, there's a really great five-step deprescribing pro process with, which I adopted into my study somewhat. Uh, but this comes from the JAMA article, Internal Medicine from 2015. Um, it talks about author Scott and they talk about this five, I guess, six-step deprescribing process. So determining the phase of care. So this is important of, is it a healthy older adult uh, versus is it someone with a limited life expectancy? So is it someone that's really end of life? Is it days? Is it weeks? Is it hours? It, the conversation is going to look a little bit differently depending on the patient. Uh, ascertaining all drugs the patient is currently taking and the reason for each one. So we'll talk about medication condition matching chart in my study in a little bit. So determining the indication is one of the most important things you can do because that's a really good flag right away of is there no indication for the drug? This may be something that we can talk about. Uh, consider overall risk of drug-induced harm in individual patients in determining the required intensity of deprescribing. So if the patient is having slight muscle aches or they're having something that we consider maybe not as severe, uh, the emphasis on deprescribing for that medication may not be as high as if the patient is having horrible orthostatic hypotension, they're having repeat falls. Uh, we want to put our energy on looking at that type of medication. So looking at drug-induced harm based off the medication in the situation. So assessing each drug for its eligibility to be discontinued, prioritizing drugs for discontinuation, which there's a lot of uh, controversy on this. There's the all-at-one approach of, you know, kind of clearing house, stopping medications as much as possible versus a slow sequential approach of determining, you know, the patient doesn't have any withdrawal symptoms. And then finally, create a deprescribing plan, implementing and then make sure the patient has the information they need to monitor the worker withdrawal effects, so what to do if they come back. So those are those are all all uh, essential pieces of the deprescribing plan. Um, so with this, uh, and, and there could be a whole lecture on deprescribing barriers because this is something that's really hot in the literature right now, and it's patient-reported barriers and barriers for for clinicians. Um, so these are, are things that um, are 
are necessary in determining because it essentially makes your job easier. So if you know what the barriers are for a patient to stop the, these medications or even talk about medications, uh, then it's, it's really helpful in you for next steps. Um, so some of these, I'm not going to go through all of them, but a big one is hope that, you know, you, you're, you're told all, all your life, you're going to take this medication forever. Then one day some pharmacist says that you don't need this medication anymore. And he says it in a very nice way, but you know, we, we want to make sure that it's not because of uh, loss of hope or it's just because of a change in goals of care. It's because of in, in the intent of the medication has changed. Potentially uh, you're looking at safety of the medication. Um, another big one is loss of routine. So I've seen a lot of patients that have um, been using anti-diabetic medications for years that checking their blood sugar and giving themselves insulin has been part of their daily life. And then when they're really in a situation where they're, that's not, not needed or not essential anymore based off our assessment, that's a big, big change to, to someone. Um, there's the, you'll be on this forever that we've already talked about, the fear of dying, fear of drug withdrawal. Loss control, that's probably the biggest one uh, for patients. Um, barriers to deprescribing for providers. So a lot of these are lack of training and lack of understanding the extent of the polypharmacy related harm. So how do I prioritize dis discontinuing medications? I don't have time to do this. I have a fear of doing this. You know, my patients are expecting something. There's the pill for every ill again. Um, and then the, the two on the left here, the ownership or the lack of communication between PCP and specialists, you know, stopping other providers' medication. There's a big ownership piece of this is who is the responsible party? I don't want to step on the toes of other, other people. So even having a conversation with a specialist about, you know, would you consider stopping this medication? What are, what are your, your reservations to, to stopping this? So they're, they're really... Uh, essential conversations to have. Um, so this brings us to a discussion of, of the study that I put together. So um, I thought, you know, with all that I knew about the polypharmacy and I pulled the literature together and I said, this looks easy. I should put a study together. Um, so that's what I did. So I had the opportunity to work with a really fantastic group at UVA Outpatient Cancer Center. So we worked at a geriatric oncologist. She was also a GA oncologist. Um, uh, physical therapist, uh, a nurse trained in, in geriatrics and myself, and we put together comprehensive geriatric assessments. And really the goal was to make sure the patient was uh, fit for their next phase of care. Was it surgery? Was it chemotherapy? Was it making a recommendation to you know, pursue more palliative measures or hospice? Is it someone that was about to undergo a stem cell transplant? So we had a wide range of different, different patients. Um, so we wanted to uh, uh, take the pharmacy piece of it. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to compare validated geriatric medication screening tools, some of which had a little bit of data in older adults with cancer. I wanted to determine the number of potentially inappropriate medications based off the comparison of these two, two groups. Um, so from, for this pilot study, what I did was I compared the Beers criteria, which I introduced earlier to the sequential application of the Beers criteria, stop, and the medication appropriate index to determine the incidence of potentially inappropriate medications. Um, and this is one of the first studies to compare this sequential application. And I found this really important because um, you use a more explicit criteria such as the beers or the stop criteria to flag as many potentially inappropriate medications as possible. And then you wrap up your assessment using a more um, explicit tool or implicit tool that's using uh, for more clinical judgment. So that uh, uh, found, as you'll see, the, the most medications that were inappropriate for my, for my group. Um, it was a small study, so we started out with 26 patients. Um, we had a mean of 12 patients per person, so it ranged from about six medications to 22 medications, but it was a mean of 12. Um, so uh, a good example of what I did was I, I put together these, these notes and I found that uh, the medication history part of it took the longest. So again, information gathering. So one of the import most important things that I'll talk about a little bit is this condition and this drug given for condition. So matching these together and then setting up, uh, you're almost, almost predicting the future of either this patient is having this symptom right now or they potentially could have it in the future based off you know, pharmacokinetic or pharmacodynamic change as they get older. So I looked at potential problems. So anything from hypertension, medications, hyperlipidemia, constipation, hypothyroid. So I, again, sort of predicted the future and then I took notes and, the, and this was 
uh, the main way of gathering information for my patients. So when I did the assessment, so I used the three assessment tools. I came up with 119 potentially inappropriate medications. So it's 119 medications here versus the beers criteria uh, just found 38 of these medications. So using the combination of these three tools together, I found three times as many uh, potentially inappropriate medications, uh, which wasn't surprising, but it also shows that the tools on their own aren't as comprehensive as they should be. So when you apply them together, you get a maximum number of uh, flagged therapies for potential deep prescribing. So we worked with the, the patient caregivers, the geriatric oncologists, myself and any specialists, and we deprescribed 87 of the 119 medications uh, in real time. So we came up with plans to stop these medications, either extensive tapering based off the qualities of the medications or stopping the medications right away. Um, and from this, we found that of the 26 patients in the study, about three medications per patient were deprescribed. Um, so these are the most common classes of medications, so some of them relatively simple. So vitamins and minerals we found that were either ineffective, where patients were uh, reporting pill burn-in, or, or we found that there were drug interactions with other medications. High incidence of antihypertensive deprescribing because of fatigue and orthostatic hypotension, uh, statins, benzodiazepines, aspirin, NSAIDs, so proton pump inhibitors. So this is very consistent with the deprescribing literature of common classes of deprescribing. Um, So to pull out some important themes from this study, and again, from the beginning, I didn't want to go too deep into the data from the study, more so setting up, you know, what's the evidence behind you prescribing and then how I applied it to a population. Some important things I wanted to pull out were medication condition matching. So going through the, the medications, the one of the biggest opportunities I found is when you have a medication that doesn't have an indication that's a red flag right there, that there is a high likelihood that that medication is no longer needed. And some of it is from prescribing inertia, as a medication was continued in the hospital for a reason entirely appropriate, and then that medication is now no longer needed. No one's questioned that. Uh, some of it is, you know, the patient had a condition, you know, you know, years ago, they lost weight, and then their, you know, their cholesterol is perfect, and they're not, they have no history of car cardiovascular disease. There's, there's, a, again, getting back to that story of, of the medication. So using that medication condition matching is, is really important. Um, again, multidisciplinary review. So the fact that we had a physical therapist, uh, a, a geriatrician, our geriatric oncologist, and a geriatric nurse, all of them had different perspectives related to medication. So more often than not, the physical therapist would find that the patients would have would be slightly orthostatic, they report dizziness, and then we would kind of uh, tailor that to our recommendations related to antihypertensive or other cardiovascular medications. So it worked really well together in terms of information gathering. Um, explanation of deprescribing and benefits to patients from the very, very beginning. So that's the first thing that I said. I said, I'm here to essentially trim down your medications. We want to make sure you're using your medications safely. Um, and uh, it's not because, uh, you know, we talked about some overcoming some of those barriers. So it's not because we're losing hope. We're doing it to make sure you stay healthy. You continue to stay healthy or the, the reason for this medication um, is, has changed over the years. So it may have been entirely appropriate when you were younger, but now that you're a little bit older, uh, the goal of that medication has changed. Information sharing was essential. So patients, caregivers, other providers, we shared our notes with patients, or I shared my notes with patients. I forwarded, faxed it all, all of my notes to specialists. So we got a lot of good feedback. Oh, I'm, you know, very happy this medication was discontinued. Um, and, or, you know, we had a couple instances, we had two instances of restarting medications because of adverse effects. So a lot of those were flagged because the other providers were in the loop of those medications being discontinued in the first place. And then uh, finally, uh, a lot of the choosing wisely themes apply to the Asian cancer population. So evidence-based medicine, minimizing therapies that are duplicate, uh, maximizing the use of truly necessary tests or medications in this case. Um, so a lot of those themes really apply. So there haven't been specific studies looking at choosing wisely recommendations, like applying them directly to older adults with cancer, but that's something that I'm looking to do in the future. Um, so all this being said, I have, this is the most common question that I get when I'm, when I talk about this is I have limited resources, you know, how is this possible in my practice site? Um, and 
don't know if this is the right poll. Yeah, I think Kate, um, is there, can you switch to a different poll? This is the first one. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to get to the second oh, one. Oh, okay. Yeah, so this is a, a common question that I get is that um, you know, all of this information that you've shared is wonderful. The data behind deprescribing seems great. I really have uh, a lot of uh, want or need to stop medications. I just can't do it. I don't know how to do it. So um, it's not possible in my practice site. It's possible with additional resources. I currently have some polypharmacy and deprescribing practice in place. I've never thought about it, but it's worth exploring. And then help, uh, which is, I don't want to spoil it, but that's the one I see the most. <laughs> yeah, so before I go into some, some resources, uh, I think that limited resources in different practice settings is a huge area of uh, research interest. So right now I'm putting an article together with a couple different pharmacists around the country, looking at how we can apply this concept and educate people and get people involved in these conversations about polypharmacy assessment and deprescribing. Because, you know, having these comprehensive reviews in all practice site, sites is not feasible. So what I will say is that looking at one, using one tool for one medication is a really good start. So picking something that be, can be consistent in your practice, finding patterns in your practice of oh, a lot of my patients report the ED because of falls, and then looking at medication classes that are high fall incident, fall producing medications such as benzodiazepines. So picking one medication, one adverse effect, and, and starting with that, and then from there you can you can implement that in all of your older adults, um, and then e even you know marketing to your patients that. Uh, they have the ability to talk about medications, uh, requesting other additional resources of, such as pharmacists, um, you know, seeking out education like you're doing right now is wonderful. So that's a really big way of getting this message out there of polypharmacy assessment. Um, so uh, it's not surprising that 60% of you have said help because we know this is a problem. We know this is really challenging. And we know that it takes a lot of our energy. It's, it's uh, exhausting to go through a huge medication list. I'll challenge you to you know, find a pa patient that you have right now with a complicated medication regimen and write it up on the whiteboard because that's so impactful just to see that visual. Um, and I've, I've done that for several patients and, and even that they're like, I can't believe I put all of that in my body. Um, so next up, uh, um, uh, so a couple of resources that I'll end with and we'll open it for the Q&A. So deprescribing.org has become one of the best resources for patient uh, materials, caregiver materials, and for clinicians. So it's very, very user-friendly, easy material to, to, to look at. It's evidence-based. So they create their guidelines based off really evidence-based protocols, and then they take uh, this information and they, and they apply it. Uh, so again, resources for clinicians, patients, and caregivers, and it's, it's separated into those different areas. Um, and as of creating this, they have PPIs, antihyperglycemics, antipsychotics, benzodiazepine receptor agonists, um, cholinesterase inhibitors, and memantine. So they have deprescribing guidelines and resources for all these different classes of medications, deprescribing de information pamphlets, um, uh, webinars, so more information out there, decision aids, so they have these tapering schedules that you can put together that's got information about why this medication may be causing adverse effect, and then a tapering plan. Um, so this is an example of uh, one of those uh, pamphlets uh, for proton pump inhibitors, so it looks at what are they, uh, why use of it is a good potentially a good idea, so some of the potential harms. Um, and it's not for everyone. So there are situations we want to continue it. So I had a patient in my study where we had uh, a GI bleed as a result of deprescribing it inappropriately. So there's information out, out there about patients that should be continuing it and then how to safely deprescribe these medications. So very easy to read, easy to follow uh, medications. So this is a, a, a deprescribing plan. So what am I going to monitor for after stopping? What are other ways of doing this? So I'm not going to just say, we're going to stop it. and I'm not going to worry about your symptom anymore. 
we're going to look for an alternative, a non-pharmacological approach. We're going to look for a medication that potentially is less harmful. Um, and then uh, what if what if these symptoms come back or continue? And then there's a section for personalized dose reduction strategy for, for all the different types of deprescribing. So it's a really good resource. I would recommend you that you check it out. Um, and the next one is uh, choosing wisely campaign. So the American Society of Health System Pharmacists have really good recommendations. So there's anything from recommendations on using lipid lowering medications in patients with limited life expectancy, using aspirin in, in older adults that don't have a history of cardiovascular disease, especially in the primary prevention setting, um, use of uh, NSAIDs in patients with you know, uh, uh, heart failure or other cardiovascular disease. And then this one that talks about not continuing medications based solely on uh, medication history unless the history has been verified with the patient by a medication use expert. And this is exactly in line with the prescribing inertia that I talked about. We need to make sure from going from point A to point B is appropriate. So looking at that and breaking that inertia is, is, is great. Um, and finally, there, if uh, there's a I had the opportunity to, to work with Choosing Wisely to discuss this in a little bit more detail. So there's a, an article that's an interview with me and a, and a researcher on intervention and medication overuse that touches on some of these other topics. And then we talk about you know, potential research efforts in the future related to preventing falls, which is a huge healthcare issue right now. Um, and then finally, there's a, a, a MedStopper uh, resource. It's medstopper.com. And it was in beta testing, and I think it's more active now. But what you can do is if it's a frail older adult, it's three simple steps. Frail older adult, check yes or no. You put a, a medication in there that potentially is inappropriate. You select the condition that it's for. So this is anxiety, sleep, alcohol withdrawal. And then you add it to the, the, um, uh, the system and it gives you this very fancy smiley face uh, scoring system, um, but, it, but it gives you a suggested taper, possible symptoms when stopping or tapering. And then the more red that that box gets on the left is the higher likelihood that that's gonna cause harm to a patient. And if you wanna get really evidence-based, you have the detail section under beer stop criteria that links you to the reasons why this therapy is potentially inappropriate in older adults. Uh, so again, this is a very practical thing that you can use and it's, it's, it's pretty quick um, and it's, it's constantly being updated. You can print a plan for your patient and I find the suggested taper approach very helpful. Um, and with that, I believe we're, we're all set and I will open it up for the, for the Q&A. Terrific. Well, thanks so much, Andrew. Um, really great work and some great resources. So uh, appreciate your yeah. work and you're sharing it with the group here um, and would encourage anyone on the call to uh, either mute and jump in with any questions or um, to use the chat function if you'd like to do that. And while folks are doing that and thinking about the help they could use, um, it does, and, and you've talked about this some, Andrew, but what do you think, I mean, I think having a pharmacist, a clinical pharmacist to work through these issues with patients and a resource like you, um, you know, is incredibly helpful. I don't know how widely available that is right now, um, you know, in organizations across the country, but it certainly seems far more um, mm -hmm. available than it was even, you know, five years ago. Um, so can you just speak to that a little bit about how people maybe find out about clinical pharmacist resources in their community and how to tap into those if they're not already? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I, I would agree that the, the, the education for pharmacists has been uh, upgraded over the years. So we're, we're thinking about it, uh, thinking about these things a little bit differently. But um, our pharmacists in different specialty areas are, are more prevalent in like larger academic medical centers because they're more tightly associated with, uh, you know, schools of pharmacy and schools of medicine and big residency programs. Uh, but there have been really great studies that have come out in the community pharmacy setting. So even approaching your pharmacist in the community pharmacy and saying, you know, I'm interested in, in deprescribing assessments uh, or deprescribing interventions, you know, I'm just, there's way too many medications, I can't, I can't handle it. So there have been really good studies of these surveys being sent from, um, or excuse me, uh, documents being sent from community pharmacies, alerting providers that their patients are are worried about this this problem, uh, 
and alerting them of it. And that showed a positive relationship with when patients went back to their providers, there was a higher incidence of deprescribing. So that coming directly from a healthcare provider back to your provider is, is something that could happen. Um, it's definitely a complicated question because there's not like a pharmacist database anywhere really, but mm -hmm. I think using clinical pharmacists in the hospital setting, um, you know, asking, I can't even count how many times I'll go into a patient's room in the hospital and they'll be like, oh, I don't, I don't even know if pharmacists worked in the hospitals. So having those readily accessible healthcare providers. So if you're a bedside nurse, you know, market us for, for your patients, say we have pharmacy services available. We have really great nurses up on our unit, on the oncology unit and say, if you ever have a medication question, our pharmacists are great and they can come in and talk to you. So that's one really good way is, is marketing. And if, if you know that they're available, but it's not something that's obvious to patients. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned at the start, academic medical centers, uh, but even um, community you know, health systems um, oh, yeah. that may or may not be academic medical centers, and then even hospitals. It seems like it would be reasonable for providers to be inquiring there. Yeah, so any 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 a community hospital, like even small small hospital, there's gonna be pharmacists that are have, having to dispense medication. And, and, there, and there's this uh, divide, artificial divide, I'd say, of like clinical pharmacists versus like staff pharmacists or operations. That's not true. We're all clinical pharmacists. We all we all know medications. Uh, so I think there's there's going to be some someone available if, if you're in the hospital in particular. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Thank you. And I'm just going to push on that a little bit more because I think um, um, perhaps the other th a few other things that you mentioned were schools of pharmacy. So in in our state at least, our schools of pharmacy have often had students who are looking to do projects and or work in clinical sites. So maybe be thinking about that as well, schools of pharmacy? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I have a, I have two students right now that just, this is somewhat related to polypharmacy, but they've reviewed all of our end of life order sets. So um, both for withdrawal of life sustaining measures or terminal extubation and for patients that are just general comfort measures that transition to hospice in the hospital. And we have language that says evaluate, you know, what we call non-essential medications. Mm -hmm. And we found that that wording was not very effective because people didn't really know what that meant. So we're gonna put some education together about either a, a dosing guide or a medication guide on these are therapies you should consider deprescribing more in the end of life setting. Um, so yeah, you're right. Using students and if you're in the area with the school of pharmacy, uh, there's always the, the young pharmacy student that's looking for something to do. Yeah. Yep. And then you just you just said another resource potentially, which would be patients in hospice that many hospice programs might have um, somebody who could help with this and or clinical pharmacists that they can access and or palliative care programs, I would think also. Um, yeah, the palliative care programs in the hospitals uh, that I work with are, are great at looking at goals and tailoring, tailoring those to medication changes. There's not a lot of literature in the hospice setting on um, the roles of deprescribing. So when we just looked at this recently, especially in the older adults for, with cancer, um, uh, subjectively, like we know that nurses are really involved in trimming down medications in hospice and having that intuition that these medications are not essential and you're, there's a change and ability to swallow, but there's not a lot of published data on that. Um, but then there's a little bit of data on pharmacist involvement and um, in deprescribing in hospice. But um, yeah, I think that's an opportunity to, to research and publish is, is the nurse's role in hospice because we know what's happening. It's just not, not a lot of published studies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. And then I think in our community, at least um, some of the larger federally qualified health centers also are fortunate to have either clinical pharmacists or pharmacy resident um, residents working there. So yeah, that might be another yeah. place to look. Yeah, I see a, a question in the chat or one comment, which I really like. Uh, we talked about polypharmacy as, as a disease. This person said perhaps a disease of the prescriber, uh, which is a, it's funny, but it's also a really good point that um, it's something that's a, it's a reactive process. Providing medications is easy versus a different approach. Um, so it's no no fault of, of anyone because that's, that's kind of what we do now. So I think the reframing of that is, is, is essential. Um, and then there's another medication or medication question related to dementia. So when should medications for dementia be de deprescribed? 
specifically for memantine and tenepazole for Alzheimer's disease? Uh, so this is a, it's a really good question and the deprescribing.org has a really good resource for going through uh, when these medications should be stopped. I don't see a lot of um, dementia um, and Alzheimer's in my practice anymore, but when I worked as a palliative care uh, pharmacist at the University of Maryland, we had a large population of, of patients that had dementia that would come in with complications and they were on these therapies. Um, so we use the family a lot. We said, you know, before and after stop starting in this medication, you know, did you see any change? And, you know, we talk about time until benefit. So giving like several um, months or, or weeks or months for this therapy to kick in, that's harder to determine efficacy because it's like slowing symptoms and it's very nuanced. Um, really what we drove in terms of changes was adverse effects. So with denepazil in particular, we saw a lot of orthostatic effects, so patients fatigued and falling. So if you see a pattern of that without much clinical benefit, that could be an opportunity. Um, as many of you know, these medications don't have a huge role in, uh, in slowing the disease. It, it does, but it's not that efficacious. So, um, you know, memantine can increase the risk of diarrhea and GI symptoms and first starting. So if it's someone that's got a limited life expectancy and you're doing a de decent job of determining that, um, these therapies are probably not going to provide any benefit just simply based off that time to benefit um, um, question. Hi. Yeah, and I saw someone raise their hand. Yeah, yeah. that's me. Um, yeah. So you kind of mentioned a little bit about what I was going to ask. Um, you were talking about using the families of the patients. Um, so I am, you know, I'm interested in public health. I'm studying public health. So the thing about one of the things in public health has a lot to do with, you know, educating um, people and um, trying to just, you know, prevention is all about prevention. Um, so one thing I wanted to ask was um, how can you, how can the patients themselves and the families be advocates for themselves? Because you were talking about how the physicians, you know, don't talk to each other. Like some of them think, oh, I don't want to step on that person's toes. I don't want to, you know, be the person to, to change this patient's medication and then, you know, kind of mess something up on the other specialists end. So how can the patients themselves and their family be an advocate speaking up for what they want if the physicians are feeling like, um, they don't want to cross certain barriers. They don't want to cross certain lines. How can the patients and their families um, speak up and prevent this um, over poly pharmacy? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, so one of the biggest things that I've seen in terms of empowering patients is uh, just asking what their opinions are about medications. And more often than not, you'll hear people say, oh, I've you know, negative thoughts about them. You know, I'm on so many, I wish I could be on less. And there was a really good study that came out recently that it actually put patients in these categories of, they call them deep prescribing categories of this patient that is, is always going to do what their provider said versus a patient that's really willing to stop medications. And then within this study, they found that it was like 98% of patients are willing to stop a medication if it's if their if their provider's okay with it, so we kind of have this information of yeah, I think these conversations would be successful, but it's like you said, it's getting patients to start that conversation, um, and going back to what I said about uh, on the inpatient setting in particular of empowering other healthcare providers to say that you know we you know recognize that you're on a lot of medications. Uh, we want to focus on, you know, quality of life, symptom management. So if patients go into those conversations with providers that um, I'm having a side effect or I have concern about my pill burden, it's impacting my quality of life. Uh, providers are, are it's supported in the literature that providers are, are likely to listen. And then this is a little bit silly, but when I talk to our residents about deprescribing in the hospital, I say to them, I say, if you stop these un unnecessary medications, this is less medications that you have to manage on a daily basis. So when you uh, work with providers kind of in that way, not, not necessarily patients are going to go to the providers and say, if you stop all these medications, you have, you have less work to do, but you're kind of doing that in a little bit of a sly way. Um, but you're, you're touching on a really great 
um, piece or you know communication piece that's missing and it hasn't been 100 percent established so hopefully you, know, you being interested in public health can uh, maybe put some research into into empowering patients and, um, and uh, but you know to sum it up i think the biggest part of it is just awareness that they're they're able to do that and that's okay um, and the barrier of you know you don't want to break a relationship with a provider I think that's something that we should just to say that it's, it's okay to start the conversation if you're not successful at least it's out there um, hopefully uh, hopefully that's that's helpful um, and I sort of answered your question yeah yeah you did thank you very much um, yeah. one thing I've noticed in my personal life is um, medication information uh, I've always gotten that information from pharmacists. So in fact, pretty recently last year, I broke my ankle in two places um, and I was prescribed a pretty heavy um, opioid for the break. I mean, I was in a lot of pain, but my pharmacist, the person who got the prescription came to me and said, this is what the doctor said, but I will suggest we start with, you know, mm -hmm prescription grade ibuprofen first <laughs> and if you feel more pain then we can upgrade you to this um and so i've only had those kinds of conversations with pharmacists and i really am as a patient i'm very grateful for that usually it's harder to get the physicians to talk about they would just say oh this is what the medication does and this is why you need it so that is my personal experience and that's why i feel like as patients sometimes we have to be the ones to start the conversation and push the the providers to actually open up and have those conversations with us so thank you yeah that's great thank you for sharing that yeah. Great, and uh, we're getting close to the end of the hour, but I've got one more question in here. Interested in hearing your thoughts on evaluating the benefit versus financial and safety risks of, risks of starting and knowing when to stop um, oncology agents. So then we've got a last poll going. Um, <laughs> so this is the, yeah, so this is one in the chat about uh, thoughts on evaluating benefit, financial and safety risks of starting knowing when to stop oncology agents. So this is uh, another really excellent question. And um, I know there's uh, ability for us to look at, you know, quality adjusted life years and, and determining, you know, the cost of, of this versus like the cost of a patient being alive. This is a really relevant question when it comes to a lot of our newer therapies. So our immunotherapies like checkpoint inhibitor therapies for, um, for oncology, because these therapies are really, really expensive getting into the hundreds of thousands of dollars a year for a course for patients. So looking at that cost versus the intended benefit and the actual benefit of those drugs. So we do look at that. So like at least at UVA, we have a high cost committee that's focused just on this question. So we're looking at benefit of the drug in terms of like how much does it increase overall survival, progression-free survival. And uh, we're looking at the burden of the healthcare system. So it's a really hard conversation to have because you don't want to not have a patient uh, therapy, especially at an academic medical center, if it's going to give someone even a little bit of benefit. So this is a really, uh, again, somewhat of a ethical dilemma type question that we have sort of offline um, with, uh, with that group. Another thing that we do, we recently changed is we've changed, increased the risk or the, or the rate of transparency of medication costs. So we've used this functionality within our electronic medical record of if it's got a lot of dollar signs by it, it means this medication is really expensive. And it's, if it doesn't have a lot of dollar signs by it, it's pretty cheap. So this has actually shown like a reduction in the use of these high cost medications using alternative therapies. Um, when you get to oncology therapies, that becomes a little bit more complicated. Um, but I think it's an excellent question. I don't have a wonderful answer for it, but yeah. Good to be thinking about though. Yeah. All right. Well, with that, we are at the end of the hour that flew by. So thank you so much, Andrew. Really helpful, really great info. And I'm going to turn it back to Kate. Thank you. Um, thank you all for attending today. Be sure to join us on Tuesday, December 15th for a webinar with Dr. Richard Barron and our own Daniel Wolfson on the impact of trust and choosing wisely campaign. We will be sharing this webinar on Workplace and through our learning network. Great. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Andrew. And thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Take care. Thanks,